Christ is basically fourth density, and it's the green. It's the heart chakra. It is unity, not just as a concept of unification, but it's unity awareness. Christians would say, like, if it's not Jesus, it's the devil, just like a blanket right. state. And that brought me great conflict because I felt there was goodness in these things. Tribalism, man. Tribalism takes spirituality and spiritual understanding and makes it connected to social cultural groups as an attempt to socially hierarchically measure who is more correct. But that's not spirituality. That is right. the sense of me that is participating in this addiction to the me game and the me game is that yellow ray third density me 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 i am but not the i am of the self that's spiritual it's the i am of the self who's forgotten it's spiritual and these yogic texts would talk about the christos or the jiva atma's awareness as a crystal clear sense of awareness that is loving and integrated with all that exists unable to be separate from anything because it is everything. And I was like, that sounds a lot like what Jesus is talking about. So the thing that's behind your eyes that is aware that when you say, I am, it is that. That's the same thing behind my eyes. The thing I love most about you is just the way you speak on things. Like uh, every time I hear you talk about like, uh, like Christ consciousness and just the way you speak about spirit and God, man. Like I'm just like, something about the way you do it it's not very like um, spiritual woo woo. Like every time you speak, I'm like, oh fuck. Like it just hits really different. And I'm like, I want that, you know? So I'm like, oh man, I wanna, I wanna talk to Rocco. I wanna see what's up and what he thinks and what he believes, you know? That's amazing. Um, Thank you. That's, that's like the highest praise I could ever hear. And it's, I would say, the paradoxically, it's the most grounding thing I could ever hear because there was a period in my life where I don't think I sounded very together about these concepts and I wanted it. I wanted to have simple, simple, the word utility kept coming up over the past several years. It's like, if it doesn't sound like it's super simple and able to be applied in someone's life with utility, it kind of does end up sounding like woo woo. So thank you. And if, if you're able to detect that, then uh, I, I, I think it, it takes one to know one. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Let's just kind of start it like that. Rocco, man, thank you for being on the podcast, bro. Um, and, and let's just keep that ball rolling. So again, like the like the reason why I was like, man, Rocco's the shit, bro. I was like, I gotta, I gotta talk to this guy. Um, I, I think we just kind of covered that a little bit, you know, on the Christ consciousness and the way you speak. It's not very woo woo, it's the utility of it. Um how how did you get so confident in God? Um, and that's where I've struggled in. Like, um, obviously, having a faith, man. I used to be atheist. I'm sure we've all went through our awkward atheist phase. Um, and then just changing that and being like, you know what? I can feel God. It makes sense. And then I feel like my journey is getting deeper and deeper as I pray and as I just allow for God to come into my life and show me things. Um, but I see people like you, and you're almost like a fucking guru where you're like, Every time you speak, I almost like I'm just like, oh shit, I believe even more. So it makes me feel like you just have so much more confidence in it. And that's kind of where I feel like, okay, I can see you're at a different level than me. I'm like, all right, well, let me learn from Rocco. How did you gain that confidence in in, in God? By following the exact verbatim thing that you just described, which was I noticed inside me. My uh, interior experience felt so less strong than some others that I was able to notice. It looked like their interior, because of how their exterior came across, but their interior just felt fucking solid. And I was like, what did they do? And I, I asked, man, I, I pursued, starting at age like 18, when I found someone who I'd say well, maybe 19 was when I clicked in because I moved to LA I graduated high school I thought basketball was my life and I was a quote-unquote devout Christian and I had this moment where I kind of you know ran into the invisible wall if you will and 
uh, living by myself in Las Vegas, but I didn't drink or smoke. All I wanted to do was play basketball. And all of a sudden, a few months into that, I start kind of feeling stuck with sadness. And like I couldn't get this sticky feeling of depression off of me, which was was even a little bit more scarier than just the depression by itself because I was afraid of not knowing my purpose or not knowing what I was doing in my life. And all of a sudden I was totally in doubt that I was meant to do basketball. And I had this night when I prayed, you know, knees on the ground, what the fuck's going on, God, you know? And I, for whatever reason, found uh, language as an access point to the divine when there was really intense sincerity applied. And I couldn't have said that to you when I was 18, but I would have these prayer sessions and I would, I'd really like, what do I thought, you know, like a conversation with somebody that you're not on the same page with and like, you know, your, your, your brow furrows and your, you feel that emotion. It's not just like a, and then also I'd like, you know, extra, <laughs> it wasn't empty. It was really intense. And yeah, passionate. Yeah. Side sidebar, I'm a byproduct of being close to someone who is an example of someone living out their dreams, and which requires a violent, severe, bizarre level of intensity sustained for a number, 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 number of years through multiple decades. And that's my dad. And so I noticed early that there was this existential thing happening in me because my dad had experienced this thing called celebrity and success and your dreams coming true. And he's an artist. It's not like he was like a businessman, you know, his, you know, they, they asked him like, Hey, how do you do this? And he was like, I listen to God and I pull my dick out and then I fucking blah, blah, and I blah. And People are like, oh my God, you're crazy. And he's like, I know, I love it. And I'm watching as a kid. I'm like, maybe my dad is nuts. Maybe he really is. But all the time I'd come home. So I moved out to LA after the basketball kind of, you know, that was like a huge intersection. That's that's October of 2008, FYI. October of 2008. Whoa, my God, I, I'm not meant to play basketball anymore. God answered the prayer. It's a kind of long story. But all of a sudden, music and acting come out of nowhere out of to my life and I'd never done art at all really and then I moved to LA and for 10 years I was in LA and every year I'd come home to visit for like Christmas and stuff and I was pursuing art music and film specifically but also deeply studying esoteric anatomy and science and philosophy and Carl Jung and in all honesty there was something about Christianity that felt like uh, a trick like it felt like I was being tricked and I, I, I didn't mm. get it. I was like, well, I get, I get the guy Jesus figured something out, but like this seems way far away from what the dude who started it was. Like this feels weird, you guys. And I would come home and as far as I could tell, my dad was the happiest person that I knew. He was the most fulfilled person that I knew. And he wasn't putting his philosophy, well, at least not a religious philosophy, he wasn't saying there was a, a prescription in a church. He was he was listening to his connection to God, and that sounded his own way. That came across in his own way, and it was custom tailored to him. And I think my proximity to him, it did it led to my wanting of that same thing. I was like, you know, I don't want his version of it, but I remember that that Las Vegas prayer did include some version of the following. God, I don't want to have to rely on someone else's words. I want to know you. I don't want to have to believe in things I don't understand. I want my, I want this specific phrase. I want a firsthand experience of your hand. That was one of the phrases I remember really stood out. I want a firsthand experience with your power, with your word, Whatever the fuck's going on, because I'm now noticing I don't know. And in the most sincerity, severity of sincerity that I can have, I want to know you. So if you hear me, if you exist, fucking tell me. 
Like, send me over there. You want me to go over there? I will go over there. You want me to put a hard hat on? I'll put a hard hat on. You want me to quit? You want me to join the Marines? Send me a signal. Send me a sign, and I'll do it. And then I started seeing signs. I started seeing a kind of noticeable difference in my reality and waking state that I could only apply this is mystical that I could only apply like oh this is this is not like normal life this is wait that's the same thing as that person said did you know that person you don't know that person oh wow what's your birthday it's the same one you have the same birthday as the person you don't know and you just said the same thing so those kind of moments kept happening and synchronicities and you know etc etc but uh you know I found an acting mentor then I, I kind of hit my dark night of the soul when I was 23 and my mentor introduced me to his mentor, and his therapist. And I started going to this therapist and that person had so much context with Christianity, esoteric Christianity, books that weren't included in the Bible. But also they were like a certified psychiatric therapist. So they were like, hey, read some Carl Jung. And I was like, awesome. I was like, I've been wanting someone who could tell me like, hey, this is great. And it's, you know. It's a book that got edited out of the Bible. And here's a couple of reasons why maybe it did. But you should come up to your own conclusion. I was like, oh, I like that. You're telling me to think for myself. Oh, okay. But also here's a book from a Buddhist teaching that says a similar thing. I was like, really? And then they were like, yeah. And then also this guy named Carl Jung. He's got some interesting kind of variations of both of those. So it- could you name those, by the way? Could you, could you name some of those books? Man, uh... There's this uh, Buddha person, monk person named uh, Tik Tik Not Tik Not Hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. There was one called. Uh, Is it the Buddhist in Christ? When things fall apart. Oh, when things fall apart. And uh, I remember that had a poetry to it that felt like the mud of the artistry that I was falling in love with, but it also felt like it had this. Uh, spaciousness and meditative quality that I didn't even start meditating until I was 24 and when I first found these kind of Buddhist lineage writings and thinkers uh, I could feel the spaciousness and I kind of wanted more of that and I, I didn't know why I didn't have that but I wanted a kind of serenity and my Christian upbringing never mentioned meditation never mentioned those inner stilling procedures like that um so that made me want that um so yeah there was a there was a dude named uh Adya Shanti I remember finding and he had specific was talking he would talk about Jesus and Buddha and compare similarities um there was one in Carl Jung's thing called uh I believe it's the Red Book the red book if i'm not mistaken um and i i couldn't even say i'm not like a, a scholar on it but i remember learning about carl young's he there's like this diagram and it was talking about the shadow self the anima the animus the ego and the id and it was this visual like a diagram and it felt so helpful and uh in all honesty i, I would read the book but then i'd go on youtube and i'd see if there was someone who would talk about that book from a more young person perspective or like, you know, maybe that felt like me who'd found it and then could recommend. So, uh, there's also another one called, uh, the diamond cutter. And it was this book where it was like a, a guy who worked in jewelry and he was a super like hungry for money kind of jeweler guy. And then he found, in the diamond cutting world or something like that. So something called the something something in the diamond cutter. And uh, it was this guy's story about in the financial obsession, obsessiveness of uh, diamond cutting and stuff, he find like the best diamond cutter and the dude was like a devout uh, Buddha, Buddhist guy. And he talked about how the Buddhist teachings gave him insights to how to cut diamonds. And so from a mm. vantage point of strictly just wanting to make money, he was like, what are you talking about? And it got him into this lineage of meditation and contemplation on some of the Buddhist teachings, which is one of them was the the Diamond Sutra. And then I found an audio book of Osho reading the Diamond Sutra. And wow, really? And going and going through that. And 
I'd heard about Osho and I'd probably like, yeah. you know, read, read some of his stuff. And it was like one of those guys. It's like, ah, cool. You know, that, that makes sense. But I never like, you know, but then the Diamond Sutra, Gautam was teaching, read by and basically broken down by Osho, really changed me uh, and gave me, I would say, contact with that Buddhic style of consciousness that my mentor was also able to help me kind of I would read and then kind of report to, you know, very, very helpful process to be able to not only intake something, but then reflect with someone you know about how it's moving. And uh, I remember that was a profound, startling realization that was something I had conflict on for a while was like Christians would say like, if it's not Jesus, it's the devil, just like a blanket right, state. Right. And that brought me great conflict because I felt there was goodness in these things. And so yeah. it's like, if you tell me that like everything over there is bullshit and you shouldn't even take a second look at it. Yeah. And then the other person says, I don't know, maybe there's something interesting everywhere for everyone. Well, that just sounds more true. This person sounds more open to the reality that there can be wisdom in all kinds of different places. They're not so tribal about their way being right. And uh, no. do you think it's because people feel like there's one light, there's only one light, and then when people find it through Christianity, they're like, oh, I found the one light, versus through Buddhism, maybe they find, you know, somebody else may find it through Buddhism, the light, versus, you know, thinking that there's only one way. The best descriptor I've ever found to, to resolve what you're talking about is... A concept, but it's not a concept, it's a reality, but it's a concept that you'll find in Vedantic or Vedic yoga teaching, and then also maybe more accessibly in a book called The Teachings of Ra, or The the Law of One, The Teachings of Ra. Mm. And the concept is called The Seven Densities. And again, it's not a concept, it's a reality. It's the reason why the rainbow has seven gradients is because the mm. electromagnetic uh, field uh, coalesces and condenses based on vibrational, uh, you know, frequency. And so, yeah. like you ever you're you're in in school and like you 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 put the water in it and you put the maple syrup in it and then you put the other thing in it and it and it uh, is like in biology class I think for me and then all of the different liquids they yep. kind of just separate on their own and. Uh, this dude named Bentinho Massaro, he, he has a really good articulation about it on YouTube. And uh, Bentinho Massaro, The Seven Densities. And it was an aha moment for me, which, by the way, I think I started realizing I was I was kind of seeking aha moments. Like I was, that's what, that's what were my checkpoints. I was like, oh, now I get the thing that I was just struggling with. Well, what's my next thing to get? And I kind of got addicted to learning. Um, and so the seven densities was a huge checkpoint because it talks about the first density is the elements. So earth, fire, water, air, ether binds them or akash. Second density is plant and animal life. And if you think about it, it's a, it's an evolution in individuation until it gets to a certain level. And then it becomes paradoxical because individuation starts to become less individual and there's this interesting flowering that kind of happens, but come to that in a second. So first density, second density, you think about, a, you know, a plant, you know, trees can literally grow towards the light. You know, animals can chase after food, but they can't speak. So the chakras are also looking like the rainbow and also looking like these densities of consciousness because it, it's how consciousness orients and organizes. And so then third density is where things get interesting and the sense of I am occurs. And also in the chakra speaking, first density is the root, Muladhara. Second density is the sacral, Svadhisthana. And then the yellow chakra, hey, the yellow chakra is Manipura. And that's where this sense of me happens. You know, an animal has moments where it has the sense of me, but it's less able to articulate and individuate it than a person right and then this thing happens in humanity 
where I, it's like this term that for me is resolved a lot called tribalism. And I started noticing, well, let me finish the thing. So Christ is basically fourth density and it's the green. It's the heart chakra. It is unity, not just as a concept of unification, but it's unity awareness. So the thing that's behind your eyes that is aware that when you say, I am, it is that, that's the same thing behind my eyes. Now, your face and skin and body suit is not my face and skin and body suit, nor hers or his or theirs or anybody's. But the sense of self behind it, behind all of ours, is a unifying sense of awareness, you could say. We have a same sense of me. I have the me, you have me. We all have this thing, me, happening prior to our sense of me. And now the thing that we say is me, which is the body-mind, which is navigating in third-dimensional depth, width, and height reality. So space. In space, we're all individuated. And time kind of creates the space moving forward. But then this feeling of love is an evolution of the sense of me that's separate from you. And now love or loving awareness feels like me and you aren't actually that different after all. Right. And then love as for density starts to become more intelligent with how it wants to aggregate its sameness. And this is just Rocco's articulation. And then you, you, they kind of say love turns to wisdom. And you could say sometimes wisdom isn't necessarily loving, but... Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it's not intelligent, and it doesn't mean that it isn't loving, but it might come across not loving, but sometimes right. wisdom can be like that. Stoicism is an in incredible reflection of that. And then, so that's fourth, fifth density, and then sixth and seventh is kind of an evolution and integration of that, and that's seven densities of this octave of reality. And then there's other things, and people get into that, but I, I kind of go to what's relevant for me, so... Wisdom, I'd say, is fifth density, and that ends up sounding a lot more like the Buddhic pathway. Fourth density sounds a lot more like the Christic pathway. And that word also started to orient itself differently than Christianity for me, was that in these yogic texts would talk about the Christos or the Jiva Atma's awareness as a crystal clear sense of awareness that mm. is loving and integrated with all that exists unable to be separate from anything because it is everything and i was like that sounds a lot like what jesus is talking about and the ending of his name is christ isn't like his last name it's right. a title right like buddha isn't the guy's name joe buddha it's not just name it's <laughs> and it's the implication that there was a budding or a, a right. flowering and so yeah, this interesting uh, difference between Christos awareness or Christ consciousness and Buddhic awareness or that sense of intelligence manifesting in a in a person in their evolution or in terms of spiritual labels and stuff. But back to your orienting question, uh, tribalism, man. Tribalism takes spirituality and spiritual understanding and makes it connected to social cultural groups as an attempt to socially hierarchically measure who's more correct but that's not spirituality that is right. the sense of me that is participating in this addiction to the me game and the me game is that yellow ray third density me 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 I am but not the I am of the self that's spiritual it's the I am of the self who's forgotten it's spiritual, that's addicted to being the body-mind, that has taxes, who has a social media, who is constantly in the world of manifest reality, which is what the yogis call maya, which is really the Garden of Eden. And uh, so, yeah, that that is a long answer to your question. Now, I find that, like, um, you know, even though we are tribal, one thing that I feel that is hard to deny or that, you know, can jump between different religions is art. Um, and I feel like art is beauty. Art is God. Art is truth. 
And every time I'd never understood why I could just look at something and have an innate feeling or listen to something and just be like, ah, uh, like I see, like, it, like it just hits me in a certain way. And, you know, and you are also an artist and I don't find that to be a mistake at all. You know, being a deep person um, and having this sense of creation in you and in all artists. Um, now I've, what do you, what do you, what do you see in that with, with different artists? Um, and in yourself as well, in seeing that beauty, that truth, that God. Cool question. Keep it. Well, there's that phrase. We were made in the image of the creator. Something along, something along those lines. You know the name Neville Goddard? No. Actually, saw oh, familiar. But you'd love him. If you if you okay. look on YouTube for uh, Neville Goddard, something like art creator. And, and long story short, he pulls out these biblical passages, but he applies them to a much more, I'd say, integral boots on the ground uh, approach for how an artist is not just like the creator, but also according to this yogic self-realization stuff, well, that means that the creator is the operating force behind every human being. And if you are created like the creator and then you end up creating as a full-time gig, mm-hmm. now, you're, now you're really like the creator because all you are is a creator. And so an artist, I think, is an archetype of a human that sometimes provides a slippery slope to end up being a bit more like the creator than one could be if they were perhaps doing something that they didn't love. And wherever someone's sense of I am is developed in their intelligence, in their consciousness, in their metaphysical evolution, that's where their art is going to go. That's something that I found interesting. It's like, why does Travis Scott make that art? Why does Lady Gaga go that direction? Why does Bob Dylan go that direction? Why do the Beatles sound so good together? Uh, Wherever someone's I am is pointed to in their art, it will be the background sensation, or at least part of it, for all of the audience's experience of it. For example, you know about this? Dude, yeah. You seen the, the new movie? I seen the first one last week so I can prepare for the new movie, but... Good idea. It's, yeah. I think, an incredible example of the story of Christ. Okay. I don't mean I don't mean the story of Jesus. I mean the story of the inner dwelling soul that is maybe the most rare form of the soul that manifests in a time where people and culture and the times and the chaos of the lands all coalesce and all meet in one moment and somebody needs to step up. And if we're being honest, this one person is best suited to come and help this crazy complex situation and help and they gotta lay it up they gotta put it all on the line but if they do put it all on the line and if they're super super honest and if they're true if they're truly the one that we think they are and we hope they are and that they could be then it might be all of our salvation and then we are them and they are us and that is the true archetype of the messiah where one person transcends their own identity because they are as a utility a device and a mechanism for the collective evolution. And if it's used in goodness, there's only so many times where that's happened. So it's going to look a certain way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And and do you think it's allowing that the creator and God to like kind of go through us and allowing ourselves to be open enough 
because I've felt like, you know, I'm an artist too. And, you know, sometimes you're so blocked, you know, and I feel like an artist. About why? What what causes an artist to, or what causes you to feel blocked as an artist? I, I would say ego, right? Like, I feel like, like, oh, I wanted to turn out like this or I don't know if. I'm going to like it maybe because of this person or this time, or maybe I'm going to be misinterpreted or whatever. So it, all those like fears and not trusting just slowly start to kind of close off that pathway. And I feel like when you, if you're able to fully relax, like I'd made the best stuff when I was just like, fuck it. Like, Oh, like just woo, free, you know? So I make videos. Uh, I used to draw a lot. Um, right now I like to do stuff like this where it's just like, yeah, yeah. So just stuff like where I'm like, that'll look awesome. And I'm like, fuck. And then I'll just go and I'll just do it. Right, right, right. Okay. I got a cool visual and, uh, elaboration to maybe respond accordingly. Yeah. So just now you said, uh, you kind of gave a hypothetical impulse and you were like, man, I feel, I just feel like that would look cool as fuck. So that's just like a pure, raw human thing, right? Yeah. In in that moment, you have a personalized, selfish sensation of something being, let's call it optimized, right? Yeah, sure. Something being optimized. Your attention is single-pointed. And you are as a instrument to articulate or optimize this process zero pointers into a kind of stillness that is amongst a bunch of movement but now you're in the center of a scenario and it's so simple what to do because you it's just dope I just need to do it oh my god it's gonna go like on this and then I don't know I don't know where it's gonna go but I gotta I'm gonna start here boom I'm going now if that same moment happens but you apply your previously kind of mentioned situation which by the way happened to me many times i would not be able to speak on it unless i wasn't covered in the mud of this experience as well um so imagine the other scenario where you go oh man this is gonna be fucking dope but then all of a sudden you think about what so-and-so just said to you the other day about the last time you did that and they didn't like it that much and then you think about that award show that you watched and so-and-so, the famous version of you, basically did it way better. And man, maybe you shouldn't do that. Also, now that I'm thinking about it, why am I doing this anyway? What's the point of this? And I mean, I got to pay my taxes soon. And is this really the best way that I should be spending? And so the mind as a yeah. faculty starts getting involved. And so now the attention is not only not zero point or single point, but it's multiply pointed at various things that are all in Maya. And you know the concept of Maya? A uh, uh, Maya? Maya. Do you know that term, Maya? Uh, yes. Isn't it that what is watching or? That's cool. But no, I mean, like my interpretation is Maya is the manifested physical world that is understood in the metaphysical journey as an illusion. So it's the physical yeah. illusion that causes our senses to steal our attention. Mm. So it's the physical illusion that steals our attention and makes us chained and shackled to the physical world through the five senses of the body. So now, if you think of it, that impulse, man, I'm going to create. Where did that happen? In the head? Not really. In the ears? Claire, audience is real, but not really. The eyes, not really. The mouth, not really. The chest potentially is like a feeling, but I don't know if there's like a biological of the heart, maybe. The gut could be said to make a case. The genitals also could be said to make a case. But it can't really be said to make one of those places the single place. And I would say as a as a theory and also my testimony and thesis, is that it happens in your I am presence. Your I am presence, the yogis say it's the size of your, I think they say this, it's the size of your thumbnail, and it's in between your chest and your belly, in your solar plexus. Mm -hmm. And it's an actual solar 
system, but it's a solar battery charged electromagnetic center point in an quite this complex environment. You ever seen those those maps of like all of the the circulatory process and the I mean there's a, there's a lot going on that allows a human being to go. So when you have that spark of inspiration, can you locate where that oriented or originated from? You could, I think, but uh, I digress. That spark is connected to God. The physical world of Maya, you have to take that spark and you have to measure it in society. And that is where I think most artists do get stuck. And it's where I've gotten stuck before as well, is in that comparison to others, the comparison to time, the comparison to everything. It's all comparison based. And it's as soon as you're comparison based, that means it's two different things just based on the definition of comparison. Comparison means, is this like this? Comparison literally means I'm going to look at this and then I'm going to look at this and then I'm going to see how these two things kind of do or don't go together. And that's the idea of separation consciousness. Separation consciousness or the fallen state where the the ego is running the show. I also like to call the ego the time-based identity structure because nobody was really able to super clarify what the ego was for me. Although these different books and different teachers helped a lot. Wayne Dyer calls the ego edging God out, which is super cool because it's like, that is kind of exactly what it does. But I look at the ego as a structure, kind of like a net or webbing that has at every intersection of the net, like a big fish net. And you're kind of like a big pile of fish inside of this fish net. Every intersection of that net has a trauma and a memory that your physiological self remembers to some level even if your conscious mind doesn't your subconscious and your biochemistry does remember it and so you're lodged in time you're rooted in time and as an artist if we're not super obedient to that divine spark and we let that channel just connect us up into inspiration we will go out and if we go out that's caesar's palace and caesar is now going to measure us and become a new god and that is where I think art becomes sullied. And this is also where spiritual warfare takes place because fame, power, sex, accumulation of needs, accumulation of wants, those are all things that satiate that ego structure, that mammal that is aware of the potential for lack and scarcity. So it wants to kind of protect itself from that. And all of a sudden now the ego is using art as this mechanism to get power or get attention or it's a complicated process. But so that's a kind of scenario. The visual that I'd like to say is imagine a lantern, like a glass lantern, but it's got like, you know, a bottom and a top. And then in the center is like a flame, you know, like a you turn the thing, and yeah. the, 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 the lamp's glowing. And a couple things here. So the Jiva Atma, the soul, the Christos, is that light. And it connects to this source that is technically, I guess, kerosene or whatever allows the flame to kind of go. And then because it's a body in a space-time, blah, 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 okay, boom, now the, the flame happens. So the wick is, is there. So that's kind of like our our spinal column, I guess, or our pineal gland and our heart and the electromagnetic charge. That's complicated too. But then the windows of the, the lantern, I would say that the windows are kind of the ego structure. Mm -hmm. And the space, the space in between the flickering flame, the glowing light, there's the glowing light, there's the space around the glowing light, then there's the windows of the lantern and then there's everything outside. The windows of the lantern are kind of like the ego structure, which you could also say is similarly the mental identity. But the space in between the windows and the glowing light is the mind. And mental awareness kind of exists there. And I, I, love, I don't know where I first found that um, visual description, but it's not mine. Uh, and I found it really helpful because if you look at inspiration 
as in spirit day or whatever that actual Greek Latin breakdown is, it, you know, in spirit. And then you look at spirit as illuminate, illuminating, or if you connect the, the property of spirit as, yeah, bioluminescence, then spirit also means light. And scientifically, you can't have light unless something's burning. And when you're on fire with passion, simple. When you're uh, clear and crystal clear clarity is right with you and you know what you want to create or you know what you want to type, you know what you want to write or, you know, the words are just flowing. You're not doubting what you're saying because you're not attending to the space outside of the lantern. You're just obedient to the flame. You know, you asked a question. I kind of don't super care if I come across any kind of certain way. I'm also pretty much addicted to being in my dharma. So I, as a sense of self, kind of have this relaxation about me that I just know I'm going to end up talking about God. I kind of just know I'm going to end up talking about the yeah. gift that I was given. And someone's going to end up seeing probably like a smile on your face like that. This dude, Rocco, had some type of connection with God. And that long story somehow just told me Rocco's testimony for God. So that was me looking at the flame the whole time. And I sense that when art is done like that, it's so precious and it's so special. And it doesn't mean that it can't be special in the other way as well, but it does get a little messy. That's beautiful, man. Um, are you familiar with Alex Gray by chance? Vivid DMT, LSD fractal shapes eyeballs spiritual domain brought into manifest reality alex gray is amazing i love alex gray he has a painting called painting uh, and there's a man and you know he's just i don't know if it's him but this man is painting um and you see everything kind of like coming in through him and from behind him and it, what it looks like god to me is like beaming through the back of his head through his eyes as he paints, um, and in the very bottom left corner of that, there's like an evil, like demon of sorts. It looks like a wolf or a dragon or just a demon of something. Um, and you know, it it always made it always it makes me so interested. Exactly, look look at the bottom left right there. You see that bottom left? Yep, right there. You see that demon right there? Yeah, yeah. That oh, you have it. Is that your phone? Yeah, it's my phone. Okay, I thought it was framed. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> it looked framed. <laughs> I was like, I know what you're talking about. I have it framed, actually. Awesome. Yeah, that that's the, I would say that's a great depiction of a demon or the Demiurge. You know about um David Icke? No, David Icke. David Demiurge. Icke is a, yeah, David Icke's a wild one, but there was a great term that I got from him, which is the demi-urge. And if you could say, where do angels come from? Where do demons come from? So it was like, hell below us? Like, how does that work? I, I, was, the, I was that kind of a young person. that Someone would be like, oh, heaven and hell. I'd be like, could you break down where those are, Tim? He's just like, so that's up and then down? And I take a left one. <laughs> Tell me again. And I think that was part of my journey, just helping me trust the process of curiosity. Like curiosity is never uh, actually curiosity usually steers us in the right, in the right way because there's a there's a reason we sense value in a place that is unknown, mm. even if it's dangerous and is only going to bring us a hard lesson and I man uh, part of my testimony is I did not know what I was getting into but I knew that I was on the good guys side and I saw all the Marvel comics and Spider-Man and superheroes and stuff so by the time I was 20 I at least knew I wanted to be on the good guy side Yeah, and uh, some people asked me to do like a hold the Bible and say a prayer over this friend of ours who's like maybe or maybe not losing their minds. And it turned into basically like an exorcism. And I was 20 and I didn't know what I was doing. But when shit hit the fan and motherfuckers start screaming, I fucking prayed like my life was on the line. Oh, yeah. 
And I felt the reality of like, something could be taken. You ready for battle? Um, uh, our father, Lord, have a hollow be in Thy kingdom come. Thy will be, oh my God, this is, wow. You know, and probably a large degree of why I felt how serious it was so soon. And then I wanted to understand what the fuck did I just experience? <laughs> and so then I start reading and listening and hearing other people try to do their articulation. And then I find this guy, David Icke, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was like a professional rugby or football soccer player dude in in the uk in the 90s and then he had i don't know if he smoked dmt or what but he had a wake-up moment and he's on like good morning america in the uk whatever their show is called and uh they're like so you have a, you have a football match and he's like the world as we know it has been hijacked by a reptilian species and they're inhabiting humanity and soul sucking out the consciousness from all of us and treating us like batteries. And that's why our young people are more depressed than ever. And he's like, starts going in. And the people are like hosting the show like, um, ah, I think we're going to go to commercial break. But I saw that and then he gives all these lectures and he talks about his, basically his main learning and his main thesis has been pretty consistent for three decades however long and he talks about the discovery that it's also in biblical texts and it's also in you know um all kinds of literature from the ages man it's like that's one of my main noticings along the way as well when you have gnosis no one can touch you no one could touch that because you know I don't believe, like, do I believe there's water in here? I mean, not really. I kind of know there is. And when I know there is, I trust I trust it. I don't doubt it. I don't have mental energy exhausted about this water right. bottle. Now, if this bottle, when I put it down on the table and then I picked it up, there was water everywhere, I would immediately properly doubt this bottle. I'd look at the structure and I'd be like, oh, there must be a leak. But then I'd look to the leak. Maybe I don't find the leak. Then maybe I look at the ceiling. Where this water come from? Now I'm properly investigating, I don't know, a mystery. Where the fuck did this water come from? And I think that's what religion causes people to forget about their own innate faculty that is so meant to be part of the spiritual journey, which is ask questions. Ask questions with a furrowed brow until you get the resolution that you were wanting. And if you notice that what you're seeking isn't coming the way you'd like, maybe adjust your approach. Maybe adjust the furrowed brow. Maybe adjust the inquiry altogether. Maybe adjust your perspective of the one who's inquiring at all. Maybe that's where the issue is, more so than the place in which you're looking. Mm. So the Demi-Urge is referenced as kind of this uh, inverted heaven. If you watch, you ever seen uh, Stranger Things? Uh, yes. Yeah. The upside down place mm -hmm. is the demi mm -hmm. And when famous celebrities or musicians or anybody uses the upside down cross or they use oh. that triple six or they in any way claim allegiance to malevolence or darkness or mm -hmm. the essence of destruction is literally like that as far as I've been able to know. Uh, the upside down place is the inverted consciousness kingdom and you could call it hell and that's just one lineage's word for it uh, but the demi-urge I also I also kind of look at the, the phonetics of just that word as a concept and it's the urge of the demi and the demi there's this Greek breakdown of it that's better than what I could do but like you know a demi god is not a full god it's like this kind of subspecies of a god but it's still better than or more powerful than a human and this urge and this emergence of I would say it's like the physical or rather it's a a spiritual manifestation of the reality of decay. Mm. So just like creation has a spiritual location concept, you know, euphoria, uh, heaven, nirvana, whatever these words are that basically apply meaning towards a state. 
the demi urge is basically where where demons come from, and then there are archons, which are basically like super demons, kind of like there's angels and then there's archangels, and there's all kinds of words that I just never heard about until I went and looked around. And then there's only so many words. Once you kind of see all of the words, they're all there. You know, the Egyptians talk about the netters and there's this Babylonian description of, you know, the great, the great, I think the, what are they called? The great de- deluge. Um, I forgot the name of the book, but it's this, uh, epic story of the fucking flood you know the same flood they tell in the bible but there's other words you know and then there's even in the bible i think there's and these other gnostic texts that they talk about the nephilim and then in our man in early on a book that really shifted me was uh the Kabbalion and the emerald tablets and uh the emerald tablets is a super shifting perspective too if you've never kind of attempted to articulate that domain but when you start to try to wrap your head around stuff that's super complex your brain and your your consciousness starts to map it out it's just like a kid trying to learn you know a new thing you're you're kind of wobbly at first and it's an unfamiliar but again if sincerity is present in that soul self that flickering flame can be like a steady light you know of two incredible opposing forces pressing you into this granite diamond in the center of it all and in there there's this incredible safety and i think that is where faith as a active practice takes us is amongst all these wild concepts like what are we talking about we're talking about all kinds of wild concepts of the spiritual journey but there is a place and a space where there is refuge there is salvation there is liberation and there are processes and techniques that others have attempted to share with us because it works for them. And if it wasn't worth sharing, wasn't worth telling, it wouldn't be worth listening to. But we know how hard it is to exist as a human being on Earth in 2024 and all of the insanity. So we're all looking for something, something that can help, something that can derive a greater meaning to my suffering, to my experience, to my perspective, to my ignorance, to my loop, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure how we got in there. The Demiers, David Icke, the demon. Oh yeah. In, in the Alex Gray picture. That's right. I I brought that up because, you know, we were talking before about art and how God kind of comes in through us and we make beautiful art. And then in that same world, music is a big example of how darkness can just consume. You know, we just had the 30-year anniversary of uh, Kurt Cobain, you know, uh, you know, killing himself. So, it, you know, it, it's just so interesting that even when there is truth and beauty, how I see art to be, you know, in that Alex Gray photo, when there's that little, you know, demon in that corner, to me, it was like, wherever that light is there's still that access to something just as powerful on the other side and i was wondering you as an artist and as a musician in that world what do you make of that where somehow people you know take on rather than the light they take on the darkness and it just didn't make doesn't make sense to me as a person looking out looking in you know well let's see if we can make this is something i speak when I'm working with someone on a specific, you know, issue. Let's see if we can completely eradicate any confusion on this topic. How's that sound? Okay. So the picture is what we're going off of, Alex Gray. If light can come in and you're kind of prosing and not for no reason that darkness can come in as well, it kind of implies that this vessel has a certain kind of neutrality to it, right? Hmm. Yes, yeah, smart. Yes. Or or at least something is up for negotiation, right? Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, if I had a picture of a bunch of beautiful angels behind me, that might imply who I am or what's going on in my consciousness. You know, if I had a big Marilyn Manson poster behind me, it might also imply my consciousness. Yeah. And so... Yeah. 
Yeah, man. Wherever we point the I am, wherever attention goes, energy flows. And the human being has the potential to be beautiful and loving and benevolent and giving and compassionate. And you ever go to, if you just think back on grade school, you know, there's bullies, there's fucking people who are just mean to you for no reason. I'm like, what the fuck? Why'd you do that, bro? And now I, now I want to go be mean to somebody else. All of a sudden, there's, you know, that energy can swirl. But, okay, now as grownups, yeah, but why'd that kid be mean in the first place? Well, let's go look closer. And this is where, out of all the spiritual stuff, I think a big piece of Western culture's wake-up call right now is into the healing arts of somatic experiencing, trauma therapy. This is why I think psychology has such a uh, like r- not repertoire, what's the word? Um, when someone knows about something that you've done, you have a reputation. Reputation, thank you. Um, yeah, psych- psychotherapy has such a reputation because I think the religious way of saying we'll fix you like this didn't really completely work all the way. And so psychotherapy kept coming up because it was like, well, what's the science? Well, your dad yelled at you and then you wanted to protect mommy and then mommy left and then it was you and dad. So then you hated that aspect of yourself and then you internalized that and then you went to, you know, it was lunchtime and... Susie said that your hair looked weird. And then Johnny asked if he could have your sandwich and you flicked Johnny off. And then Johnny's dad flicked him off one day and he said he wasn't worth, he was worthless. And so you flicked Johnny off. And although that's not that bad, Johnny smacks you. So when we start looking at the somatic implications of trauma, and how patterns of consciousness can get stuck in our bodies. Mm-hmm. It's another kind of less woo-woo version of saying spirits that are not your own can get stuck in your vessel and act out without your implicit consent. Wow. Wow. Now we're talking about trauma. We're talking about patterns inherited from family members. But let's also apply that to your great-great-great-grandfather. Could his patterns of behavior still be present in how you're acting out your daily schedule and responding when your nervous system contracts and when you feel like you're in lack, when you haven't eaten in a long time, when you didn't sleep as much as you wanted to, and your your lover is a little too harsh in how they responded? And now is the perfect time if you wanted to act out and let that impulse be less loving. So... That's kind of the psychosomatic, shamanic, ancestral heritage trauma process. And in that exact same way, we're talking about the spirits of beings who are related to us. Well, are there spirits of other beings? And as much as one studies, you'll be able to tell that there is. And although there is one uniting God, the infinite, I look at it as like a cone, the infinite Brahma is infinite. No measure because it's everything is everything. And then even Shiva is, is a cool concept because it says Shiva is that which is not. So there's everything that is. And then somehow there's everything that isn't. And that's also something. And non-duality is the attempt at observating, uh, observing and the lineage of those who have observed all of that and how it unifies into no longer being two separate things the inner and the outer the upper the lower and it's just all one thing it's not two separate it's one thing um so that there are spirits and there are angels and there are demons and i look at a demon as a demon and mon is one mono but a demon means it's from one but it's not one and 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 an angel is an and gel and and you could say and gel gel is kind of like obviously an english word i don't know the roots but gel is like something that binds other things and it's uh also an angel is like an angle and 
an angle determines the amount of space and also the velocity in which things can move in that space. If something's taking that path, it's a quick turn. And, you know, I don't know what kind of car you got, but you'd be able to take this turn faster than you take that turn, right? And uh, if you see the science of sigils, you know what sigils are? No, sigils, no. Sigils are basically shapes that aren't just shapes. They're spiritual forms or they're spiritual, even sometimes beings or markers of beings, kind of like signposts. But they're written in such an ancient way. And this is where Aramaic, Hebrew, and Sanskrit, I think there's some other ones that are so ancient that uh, like the cuneiform tablets and like, I forgot the Sumerian language, but uh, some some language were so so ancient and those who wrote it and anchored it were so in touch with the divine that those shapes aren't just shapes and letters for no reason. Those are actually the phonetics of the vowel sounds and the consciousness, the shapes of the consciousness formations. So like, I actually, funny enough, I have some Hebrew on me. Um, oh, wow. And if you watch this movie... You know, there are some symbols and stuff, and I think they're pulling from, and I know they made up their own language and stuff, but they're pulling from Hebrew. And uh, the idea is that when you make that motion or that movement and you anchor that in the the sealed, in the akash, in the ether, it's like a doorbell for that house. Even if you're not at the front door, when you write that, you ring that doorbell wherever you are. You know what a good example of this is? I feel, I feel, oh, I guess not. That's, that's it. I have a Bible there, but I was looking for just a cross. But if I just held up a big picture of the cross in Jesus right now, would you be confused is what I'm talking about? Oh, so, so uh, like, yeah, like if I held up a big picture of Jesus and the cross, would you have any confusion about what I'm, what I'm pointing? No, 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 not at all. It's like a doorbell for a house that is very clear about who lives in that house, right? That makes sense. Like you, you have no doubt of what it is. Well, it's Jesus. It's like regardless of how you interpret it, it's like are you confused as to who lives behind this symbol? Here's another example. Are you confused as to who this symbol is? No, not at all. Um, this is fun. I mean, that's that's a buffalo. Are you? If you know, imagine you never see a buffalo, and I said, "Hey, that's a buffalo," and you said, "A what?" Right, your mind can't even, yeah, right. Um, do you know what runes are? R H U N E or R U N E? They're in other like Nordic, Scandinavian cultures. They use them, but I mean, if you Google Nordic runes or Scandinavian runes, or you Google sigils, you'll see this library of shapes and symbols. And all I'm attempting to do is come back to the thing that you kind of alley ooped about. Can other beings come in? Basically, if there can, if, if good stuff can come in, can bad stuff come in? And all I'm doing is to attempt to illustrate. Yeah, good over here, bad over here, and everything in the middle. Every vibrational signature in the infinite spectrum. Of all that exists, if your I am looks at it, you're deriving meaning, or you could say if you conjure up meaning. You ever heard someone say that? Conjure up meaning? Like coming up with it? Yeah, like don't conjure up meaning about this. You ever heard someone say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what the word conjure means? It reminds me of like a cauldron, like making something. <laughs> So what archetype of character is usually making something in the culture? Creator or a witch or... yeah. Now, what's so interesting about a witch? Why is that even a word? Why does it feel a certain way to talk about? Uh, mm -hmm. A more spiritual character or a less spiritual character? I didn't say good or bad. Right, more. They're known for being specifically somehow innately spiritual and 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 think of every time you've ever heard of a witch or a wizard in a cauldron in a story 
they're used as a device to move the story forward to all of a sudden deal with a little bit more spirituality than normal. That's beautiful. So there's there's a there's all kinds of fun stuff in there. You've heard of Merlin. Merlin? Merlin? You know about Merlin? You know about King Arthur? King Arthur the like the the story of King Arthur? The sword and a stone? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you know, you know he meets you know he meets like a mentor who's spiritual and he lives in like a cabin in the woods or a hut. Is that Merlin? That's Merlin. Like like Yoda, like Yoda. Who is Yoda? Right, right. Okay, so he, he so they're the does Yoda have a utility. Why why does Yoda have utility in the movie? Yeah, but, but even for our, how you know about him, you know, even when the recent I don't know if you saw the Mandalorian, people call him Baby Yoda. This wasn't even Baby Yoda, but Yoda is such a famous character. How come? Why? Well, he's the spiritual master, Yogi. He's like this yogi little green gremlin thing that's super benevolent and good and loving and wise and weird and uh reclusive and he's in the hut he's in the hut in the woods and he teaches the hero what right in order to wield the elixir or the remedy to the dragon the the deepest sense of dark violent danger that has the potential to destroy everything they care and love about tiny soft little wise creature has some knowledge that might help but I have to tell you it's not going to be easy you have to come over here to me in order to get it you're probably not going to be understood by others because this path is not for most but it's for the one who's super sincere about resolving the conflict with the deepest darkest most dangerous thing these are these are beautiful archetypical shapes and characters and aspects of our own internal consciousness just imagine that there's no guru called yoda it's just a version of yourself that you have put in the shape of a character named yoda imagine there's no character named luke skywalker it's just you when you're really in touch with your readiness to be a hero uh-huh salvage the situation as crazy as the situation is you know about joseph campbell yeah absolutely i love joseph campbell joseph campbell made a life about studying this stuff because he saw that story about spirituality sounds a lot like that story about spirituality yeah 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 yeah, yeah. did you guys know each other no we didn't even know they existed really you didn't even know they existed there's the same story yeah that's kind of that happened to me I kept having that what'd you say you said that that is the th- really and then I'd go home and I'd try to talk about it and you know a, a loving family member Christian would probably say don't read that it's forbidden it's, it's the devil I was like do you know that for sure or are you just kind of recycling like a script that you were given that you don't even know you were given? That's beautiful, man. Well, we're, co- we're coming up on the hour, bro. I This was amazing, bro. This is great. This was very deep. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about your projects that, uh, that you're working on. Um, I loved Hidden. That was awesome, bro. The camo and everything. You did something really cool. You drifted some stuff. You drifted some some clothes and you made it your own but then you also had your own type of uh you know uh garments that was awesome um what what's next for you man man thank you man thank you for your intention and i looked through your page and the different people that you have on and thank you for your seeking and your finding and your use of your intelligence and your very well spoken and articulate and your curiosity is obviously anchored in a sincerity and that feels so good, man. So it's a gift that you you know want to connect. It's a gift that you want to ask. It's a gift that you want to share. This so thank you for your work. You know that's that's awesome. Um, my work is so much fun. I'm a, a yogi artist, and that kind of lets me always only do one thing, which is my dharma. And in my service, 
Sometimes it's music. Sometimes it's fashion. Sometimes it's film. Um, yeah. I just finished a new draft of a screenplay that I wrote called Overnight. Wow. I'm be more excited to make that film. Um, I am currently editing a book that I wrote called Moon Theory. And Moon Theory is how to miss out on nothing and live your most lit life in the digital age and heal FOMO. And I've found that FOMO is the number one cause of mental illness and self-harm in the entire world. So it very well may be the number one pandemic in modern human history and the cause of depression. And uh, I studied it for like 10 years and the word moon came to me because I kept staring at this dilemma and uh, I found the word FOMO, fear of missing out. And then God gave me this kind of code of moon miss out on nothing is how you solve or remedy the fear of missing out so that book is being edited and coming out in divine timing sometime soon um but yeah right now man i have a a, a, a kind of cool palette of uh projects that i help others with and that's sometimes music sometimes creative direction um i'm making a, a doing two different books with my dad i'm working on some music with my dad my dad's doing a series of shows in Texas in April, and he asked me to like be a production manager. So I'm like making sure the the lighting and the sound dude are like gonna be there at the same time. And I'm I'm in my left I'm in my left brain pretty much completely for that stuff, and then uh, writing film, writing book, making music. My brother Hassan and I have an album coming out called Nowhere, and our group name is called Apostles, and We've got our new, uh, the, sing- the first single called Freedom and then Surprise coming out soon, probably in May, seriously. And uh, my brother Nolan and I, our band is called As You Are, and we got some singles locked and loaded. We're like getting the artwork nice and good. I had a studio session last night here in Waco, Texas, and uh, got, the, got the next edit of the song, Matt Black, coming along and so music, fashion, film, and then so entrepreneurial, and then service, and stay in kind of service to those who want to work with me for the yogic self-realization process. Sometimes that's plant medicine journeys. Sometimes it's kind of more like a psychosomatic soul retrieval, working through why trauma is guiding us away from what we're meant to be doing and into stuff that's sabotaging our divine potential. And uh, I basically love untying knots. <laughs> And that's pretty much all that I do. I just untie knots. You know, a project comes up, someone's trauma, someone's, you know, wants to do a thing. I want to do a thing. And I just start untying this knot that's in front of me. Uh, one of my, my teachers, uh, Will Dupree, great, great phrase. He said, you know, yoga is basically just a long process of untying the knot that is you. Mm. So... So that's what I do in all the different ways that it shows up. It might look like many things to others, but for me, it's always one thing. Dude, that's awesome. And uh, I'm excited to kind of keep seeing the stuff you come out with. It's always so, it looks very just genuine and it's nice to see someone who has such a, you know, deep connection to spirit take full action in the world. Man. Thank you so much for saying that. I know we've got to get out, but like that to me is maybe that was actually my main project for like several years, to be honest with you, because I felt like I got so entangled in the physical world and lost and confused and literally sick. And then I wanted spirituality so intensely. And I think I got a little heady, you know, I think I got a little un uh, ungrounded. And I, then I wanted the groundedness and I wanted that integration. And uh, thank you for seeing that. Thank you for, for noticing that. And uh, I think we can't notice that which we are not. So it takes one to know one, sir. And thank you for taking your dharma into this fun format of a podcast. It's a, it's a great thing. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for being on, by the way. Yeah, yeah man. You too. And shout out to uh, brother Troy Casey and uh, all the Paul Czech souls oh fuck yeah all the checkies out there those are my homies yeah yeah all right guys peace out Cheers. if you believe more constructive information like this should be out there for people to know please leave a like on this video and if you're a person who's into self-development in all aspects of their life 
please subscribe because that is what we do here at Good Demand. Keep demanding good things. And if you haven't bought a pair of Good Night Blue Blockers and you use a phone at night or an iPad or TV at night, please consider buying a pair of these. They're beautiful and they work so well and they help support our growth.